Welcome to section 8.4, solve polynomial equations in factored form. Now, the first thing I need to talk to you about in this section, is something called the zero product property. And what that says is if you have two numbers, in this case, A and B, and they multiply together to make zero, what that means is that one of those numbers has to equal zero. So in other words, either A has to equal zero or B has to equal zero. They could both be zero at the same time, or you could have two different values. Uh, so frequently when we're trying to solve polynomial, polynomial equations like this, we're actually going to have more than one answer. Now, one other term that I just have to make sure you know uh, is roots. Uh, if you're talking about the roots of a function or the roots of an equation, it's asking about the zero product property. It's wondering what values of X make this equal zero. Uh, roots, uh, in other words, then, are the same thing as the x-intercept. Uh, and sometimes uh, your book will also refer to these as zeros. What value of x will make this equal zero? So let's go and actually try combining these together and solve some problems. So uh, we have x minus 4 times x plus 2 equals zero. So you have to remember first that this is multiplication in between here. So in other words, we have one thing times another thing equals zero. So what that means is either the first thing, that x minus 4, has to equal zero, or the second thing, the x, uh, x plus 2, has to equal zero. Well, now at this point, we can solve for x in both of these equations. So we can add 4 to both sides, and we come out with an x equals 4. Or, in the other case, we can subtract 2 from both sides, and we'll come out with an x equals negative 2. And these would be our two different solutions. These would be our roots. These would be our x-intercepts, if this were a y equals equation. Uh, or these could also be referred to as zeros. Uh, any of those terms all mean the same thing. We're trying to figure out what value of x makes this equal 0. The other thing in this section is talking about factors. Uh, and if you remember, factors are things that multiply together to give you something else. So like factors of 8, uh, you, two factors that would be like 2 and 4, because 2 times 4 makes 8. Well, now we're going to actually talk about it in terms of uh, polynomials. And what we're going to actually look at here is what can we divide out from both parts uh, in order to just sort of make this a more simplified equation. For example, uh, in 12x plus 42y, let's start out just looking, out at, looking at those main numbers, 12 and 42. Well, what number could we divide out of both? Uh, we could for sure div divide out a 2. Uh, and if we divided out a 2, what, how we would write this is it's actually going to be written as sort of reverse distributive propertying. Uh, so we could pull a 2 out in front, and then we'd put some parentheses there. Uh, and so 12 divided by 2 would leave us with a 6, so we'd have a total of 6x, plus 42 divided by 2 would give us a 21y. Well, both that 6 and the 21, those could actually be divided by 3 as well. So now we could actually pull out a 2 times 3, and what would be left would be 6 divided by 3 would leave us with a 2x, plus 21 divided by 3 would leave us with a 7 why? Well, 2 and 7, we can't divide anything more out from those. x and y, they aren't the same variable, so we can't divide anything out from that. We could simplify, though, that 2 times 3, and we would get a 6 times 2x plus 7y. You also might have noticed at the beginning that 12 and 42 could both be divided by 6. And if you did that, you would actually skip all of these middle steps, and you could jump straight to this final part. So if you can come up with the greatest common factor and divide that out, you're going to get to the answer a lot faster with a lot less work. For this next one, uh, let's start at looking at what can divide out 4 and 24. Well, they can both be divided by 2, but they can also both be divided by 4. So let's divide a 4 out, which will leave us with an x to the fourth plus 24 divided by 4 is 6, x to the third. 
Well, the nice thing with uh, factoring like this is we can actually factor something out of our x's as well. Uh, because remember, your x to the fourth is the same as x times x times x times x. And your x to the third is just an x times x times x. So if we're factoring out in this case, which in this is essentially the same as dividing out what can be divided on both parts, we can actually divide out three x's that are multiplied together because that's going to be the same for both of these. So in other words, how this ends up looking uh, is we would end up dividing both of these by x to the third, oops, uh, by x to the third, uh, and that would leave us then with a four, x to the third on the outside, uh, and then on the inside we have an x to the four minus three, this would be the first power, plus we would still have that six, and then x to the third divided by x to the third cancels out to a one. Six times one is just six. So this four x to the third times x plus six will be your fully simplified final answer for factoring out that greatest common monomial factor. Why do we do this? Well, it actually lets us solve problems a lot easier once we're able to factor these out. So for example, two x squared plus eight x equals zero. I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I see that equals zero, which is good because that means we can use that zero product property, but that means we need to have some stuff multiplied together. And the only operation that I see here is addition, which is not multiplication. But if we can factor something out first, then we will get some multiplication that's just sort of hiding in the problem. So for example, uh, the two x squared and the eight x can both be divided out by a two which will then leave us with an x squared plus x equals zero. Oh, sorry, x squared plus four x equals zero. Um, well, that helped a little bit, but not too much because x squared plus four x, I still don't, know, still don't know what makes that equal to zero. But I was silly and completely missed the fact that I could also divide out an x. So we can actually have a two x, and what would be left would be an x plus four equals zero. Well, now this is nice because we have two things multiplied together. We have that two x times the x plus four. Well, that means either two x has to equal zero or x plus four has to equal zero. On the first one, we can divide both sides by two. and It'll come out with an x equals zero. Or on the second one, we can subtract four from both sides and we'll come out with an x equals negative four. And now that by factoring, we were actually able to come up with an answer pretty quickly. Let's try it again on this next one. Now this next one's a little tricky because it doesn't equal zero right away. So what I will suggest is subtract everything from one side to get it onto the other. So in this case, let's subtract 15n from both sides. So we'll have a 6n squared minus 15n equals 15n minus 15n leaves us with a zero. Uh, well, at this point, we can now factor out whatever is the biggest thing we can pull out. So from the 6 and the 15, those could both be divided by a 3. And our n squared and the n can both be divided by n. Now, when we do this, 6 divided by 3 will leave us with a 2. n squared divided by n will leave us with just 1n minus 15 divided by 3 will leave us with a 5, and divided by n cancels each other out, so we're left with just that equals 0. Now we have two things multiplied together equals 0. We can set both parts equal to 0. So 3n equals 0, or 2n minus 5 equals 0. On the first one, we can divide both sides by 3, come out with an n equals 0, or uh, for solving the next one, we'd have to add 5 to both sides. We get a 2n equals 5. We can now divide both sides by 2, and we get an n equals 5 halves, or in other words, n equals 2.5. Well, again, we have two answers. One is 0, one is 5 halves, or 2.5, and, uh, and we were able to solve it pretty fast by factoring. The one thing you do need to remember to do at the beginning is just always make sure that one side is equal to zero. If it's not, you have to move stuff around in order to get it there.
The last thing in this section uh, that will be covered is a vertical motion model. Uh, and what this says is just that the height of some object that is either thrown or dropped uh, is equal to negative 16 times the time in seconds squared plus your initial velocity v times the number of seconds plus s for your starting height. Uh, so for example, a startled armadillo jumps into the air with an initial velocity of 14 feet per second. After how many seconds does it land on the ground? Well, uh, if it starts from the ground, that means its initial height was zero. Uh, so that's nice because that will cancel out that S. And we know that its initial velocity was 14 feet per second. So that's going to get plugged in right up here for V. So we can now have an equation of H equals negative 16 T squared plus 14 T. Well, we want to know when does it land on the ground? Well, the height on the ground is zero because we're talking about the distance above the ground. So we also know that our height is going to end up being zero. Well, now we have something that's going to equal zero. Chances are we're going to have to try to factor this. Uh, so let's see what's the biggest thing we can pull up from both sides. Well, negative 16 and 14. Uh, let's just go and pull out a negative 2, uh, which leaves us with an 8t squared minus 7t. Uh, I guess we could also have pulled a t out from both sides. So we'd have a 2t, which leaves us with an 8t minus 7. And now that leaves us with two things being multiplied together, that 2t times 8t minus 7. So in other words, either negative 2t equals 0 or 8t minus 7 equals 0. Well, for the first one, we can divide both sides by negative 2, and we get that t equals 0. Well, this makes sense, because at time 0, the armadillo is still on the ground. It has not been startled or jumped into the air. So we want to know when it lands back on the ground. Well, that means you have to add 7 to both sides. Uh, 8t equals 7. Divide both sides by 8. Get t equals 7 eighths. So just one eighth of a second short of one second is when the startled armadillo jump lands back on the ground, which makes sense because you can't normally jump in the air for more than a second. So this seems pretty reasonable. And that's the last thing I've got for you. So good luck. And as always, let me know if you have any questions.